Jack, Jack, Jack. Hello, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining. I know you've all been looking at a lot of TypeScript, so for a change of space, you'll get a little bit of Swift today. Uh, so Peggy gave me the official introduction. I'm going to give myself uh, an unofficial introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Ellen Shapiro, and in June, I joined Apollo as a mobile engineer focused on the iOS SDK. Uh, I am an iPhone and Android developer. This year marks a decade since I started building apps for both platforms with extremely little idea of what the hell I was doing. I have a somewhat better idea now, uh, but getting to that decade marker makes me feel both very proud and really old because a decade working on anything tech is considered essentially forever. Uh, I've built a ton of apps over the years, but I've only had an opportunity to wa work on tooling and SDKs a little bit until now. I also do a decent amount of public speaking at conferences for both iOS and Android developers, and over the last two years in particular, I started to hear a lot about GraphQL. And one of the things that jumped out at me immediately as a mobile developer was how it had the potential to make an to evolve an API, uh, to iterate on designs, to make that whole process a whole lot easier than it was with REST requests. And I was really interested in working more with GraphQL. And not too long after this, I saw a job listing uh, to come work on the iOS SDK at Apollo. And the engineering team was largely remote, because as Peggy said, I was actually living uh, in the Netherlands at the time. I was actually living in Nijmegen, uh, but I forgive Peggy because it's really hard to pronounce that. Um, uh, but I was, I was really enjoying the good life of uh, stirrup waffles and cycling and staggeringly strong Belgian beer. Uh, and it turned out that the guy who originally wrote the iOS SDK, uh, Martijn Walraven, uh, actually lived in Amsterdam. So it would be relatively easy for me to work with him to find out exactly where things needed some serious work in the existing SDK. So in June, I started digging into the iOS SDK. And I learned that in addition to the work I already knew it was doing, taking GraphQL queries and using them to generate network and parsing code, it also does some significant work with caching in order to keep unnecessary network calls to a minimum. So it was a little bit rough working with the iOS SDK at first. Um, Martijn had moved on to bigger and better things at Apollo. And while Apollo's Android SDK had really been embraced by the community uh, and moved significantly forward by the open source community since it was originally built, the iOS repo was a little bit less active. Um, well, not entirely less active, as there were, at least of, uh, May, as of May 1st, which was the last Wayback Machine snapshot I could find it from before I started, there were over 150 issues and 33 open PRs. Um, and seeing those numbers when I started was a little bit frightening, uh, if I want to be honest. But it, I knew that if I was able to work with Martijn to figure out what was going on, I'd really be able to take a machete to the backlog and move things forward really quickly. And despite the fact that I had to take a couple of weeks off to move back to the United States, uh, which involved taking five enormous duffel bags, two rollerboard suitcases, two backpacks, and one extremely displeased cat on an international flight, we have now managed to hack the issue list as of last night to a third of what it was six months ago, and the list of open PRs to one. I am super proud of this, but I want to talk about what has changed pretty significantly in the last few months, particularly in the context of hacking through the backlog. Because sifting through the issue pile, I immediately saw that an enormous stumbling point for pretty much everyone was simply getting started with the library, because it was a considerably more complex proposition than adding a number of other libraries in iOS. Usually, you'd pick a dependency manager, CocoaPods, Carthage, or Swift Package Manager, and then you'd basically be done and ready to use the library. With what we're doing in the Apollo iOS library, that's kind of not possible, and it's mostly because we use the library to generate a bunch of model and parsing code for you. Our code generation library takes a look at a combination of the schema you've got from your backend, which defines the world of what is possible, the queries you've written locally, which define what you're actually asking for, and after checking that what you're asking for is in fact possible, it applies some magic to combine all of that information and create Swift code. And the huge benefit of all this is that you get type safety from end to end throughout your entire stack. Is a parameter for a query declared in your schema as a string? Then the code generated will enforce this at compile time and fail loud and hard and quickly when you try to pass it in integer. So this is an enormous benefit of the Apollo SDK, but there's some stuff that our code generation library needs to know in order to make all of this work. So what schema should be used to generate the code? 
What are the queries that need to be added to that schema in order to generate the code? What should be done when we're actually with the code that we generated? And then any other options that the CodeGen library can potentially handle. It is basically impossible to do all this without setting up a run script build phase in order to pass all of this information along to the CodeGen library. So setting that up is kind of annoying, but it wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest issues came after setting up the run script build phase because the code generation library is written entirely in Node and TypeScript. And for a lot of iOS developers, if you even mention the word JavaScript or anything related to it, they will run for the hills with their fingers in the air screaming, no, I don't want to, because there's some defensive instinct there. A lot of us have deep scars from working with cross-platform JavaScript frameworks over the last decade, and I, I include myself in that phrase. But it's also because if you are not working with Node or NPM on a daily basis, getting it set up can be a total nightmare. For instance, if you tried to install iOS previously, you'd go through the standard dependency installation process for your package manager, then you'd add the build script, and as you work through the instructions, you'd see you had to run NPM install Apollo. But if you didn't have NPM installed, then you'd need to use Homebrew to install NPM. And then if you didn't have Homebrew in installed, you'd need to figure out how to install it. And the whole thing was extremely frustrating. Another path we saw that developers who did have NPM installed, they would be able to get through the first three steps, but then they wouldn't really be sure whether they had the correct version of the CLI for the current SDK. They would run into weird issues depending on whether they had used NPM install or NPM install dash G, and again, would get really, really frustrating, and people would often give up at this point. And seeing this whole process, we knew we really needed to eliminate this huge source of frustration for iOS developers. And the solution that we eventually came up with was essentially to cut NPM out of the process entirely. So our tooling team uh, recently added a new job to our continuous integration server, uh, which is called Build CLI. And it builds a tarball on every commit to master that includes a full node runtime along with all of the dependencies necessary to run the Apollo CLI. Now, after some changes to under the hood scripts that come with the iOS SDK, this process is a lot more straightforward. You follow the same first couple of steps, installing the dependency and then adding a build script, this time one that calls this new included script. Then that updated build script will automatically check to see if the tarball needs to be downloaded and or unzipped, do whichever of those uh, it needs to, uh, or both, and get you something that runs out of the box without ever having to worry about Node or NPM, and you can use our library for its intended purpose without further delay. So this has been really, really great because it means iOS developers don't have to deal with NPM and TypeScript silliness, and everyone using the default setup has exactly the same setup in terms of dependencies, CLI version, and Node version for a particular version of the iOS SDK, which makes debugging problems a lot easier. So that's the biggest thing that's changed. It's also become clear that we had to do a better job of explaining some of the harder things to understand about how our library works. For example, something in the issues which seem to trip up a ton of people is the way that the SDK uses double optionals, particularly in input objects. So for example, in the Star Wars schema that we use as a test bed for a lot of our work, there's an input object called a review input, which allows you to add a review for a particular episode of Star Wars with some stars and some commentary and maybe even your favorite color. And when people see this type as the parameter for commentary, they can get really confused. Is it an optional of an optional? Why not just write it with two question marks to make it clear how incredulous we are that this even exists? But the thing that I found is this is easier to think of as an optional optional string, a nested optional, because then you can look at what's happening with the two optionals separately. The outer optional tells us whether any value at all is, is even being included for a particular parameter. The inner optional tells us that a value was in fact included but we're not sure if it's a typed value or nil. So why is it generated like this? It helps to look a little bit at the JSON for this object in the schema. For the input object, three parameters are described. The first field is the number of stars, and an important thing to note is that it's non-null with a scalar type of int. And it means that it has to be present and non-null and of type int. So when code is generated, that field is set up in Swift as an int parameter. That part is pretty straightforward. What's less straightforward is the other two fields. Their types are a scalar and an input object, and there's no nested type information. So why aren't they generated as non-null input types? Well, because GraphQL no fields are nullable by default. 
Now, you would think that this would simply create a single optional, and it does when you're parsing objects returned from the server. But when you're sending objects to the server, it's important to understand that not only does a nullable field not to ha have to have any value, it also doesn't even have to be present uh, in the data that you send to the server. And so the generated initializer uses a double optional for the corresponding parameters for these two fields in the initializer. So what does this look like when you actually go to send data? Well, it depends on how you use that initializer. If you use the default values of nil for both double optional parameters, only the value of stars will be sent. If you pass in a raw string, some magic happens under the hood of the Swift compiler to say, aha, ultimately this wants to be a string. Here you have a string literal. It double unwraps and says, yes, there is a value here. It is of a type spring, and you could send it to the server. Now, when you pass nil directly to that parameter, you still only get the stars going to the server, similarly to the first implementation where you got that default value of, value of nil. Now, this trips a ton of people up because they think if they pass nil to commentary that null should be sent to the server. But because there's a double optional there, you actually have to tell your input object to actively sell, send null to the server by passing a value of some nil. This tells the compiler, hey, there is a value I want the server to know about. It is just null. And that's not that complicated, but it's just a little bit against what some developers are expecting out of the box. Speaking of which, another thing we could probably do a better job of explaining is our approach to caching. This is actually a huge feature of what we do, but not a lot of people understand how it helps them, and there are some misunderstandings about what gets cached and how. The first thing to grok is that we're using a protocol called normalized cache to store things in the cache. Normalization is a fancy way of saying, being able to take different objects returned from net different network calls and realize that they are the same thing. And a really critical question when you're dealing with cache normalization is figuring out what to use to normalize that response. How are these things actually related? And by default, we use something fairly simple. We actually use the path of the query itself, which allows you to make a few assumptions. So let's take the example of two wars against our Star Wars symbol Sigma, one just getting the hero of a particular episode, uh, and another getting the hero's name and their GraphQL ID. If you start from an empty cache and you initially make a hero name query, the result of that query will get stored using a cache key that fills in any variables in the cache. Then if you use a hero name with ID query, the cache looks at the path for the search key. For the name key, you can see that the paths are identical, so the query can get the value from the cache to fulfill this property without having to go to the network. However, since when the query starts to look for a key with the path to the ID field, it doesn't find it. And one thing to be aware of in the iOS implementation in particular is that if not all of the properties can be found in the cache for a particular query, that causes a cache miss for the entire query. No partial results will be returned from the cache for that query. Now, this can differ out of the box with what people are expecting, particularly if they are using a GraphQL ID to uniquely identify their objects. They expect that the identifier would be the cache key for their object by default. However, we've seen that a really big percentage of users need to use other things to uniquely identify their objects, particularly if you're adding GraphQL to an older database where there's some kind of additional identifier, like the ISBN for books, or even a combination of the ISBN and a generated UUID from a pre-GraphQL version of your server. There's no way right now for us to know that in advance. So it's really hard for us to normalize queries automatically if we don't know how to disambiguate those objects. So we provide a cache key for object property on Apollo client and Apollo store, which is actually a function that takes an unparsed JSON object from our server and uses it to couch, calculate a cache key that's also a JSON object. The simplest implementation of this checks the GraphQL identifier on a particular object. If it's there, it can look for the object with that identifier. If not, it falls back to the query path. One thing to watch out for here is potential identifier overlap across objects, which means that you'd want to check a combination of the identifier and the type name, which all queries on iOS request in order to help with type safety. And you can return these as an array to use as your cache key, or you could cast both of these values to string and concatenate them to use a single string as your cache key. And the nice thing about this flexibility is that if you're not using your GraphQL ID as your identifier, you only need to swap out whatever properties you're checking for and sticking into the array and or concatenating, and you'll be able to get uniquely identifiable objects from anything. Now, one thing to be aware of is that by default, all of the caching that we're doing takes place in memory with the help of an included class called the in-memory normalized cache, 
This is automatically created for you by default under the hood when an instance of Apollo client is created. There were some instances where developers wanted to make sure not everything was cached in memory. And this is where the first of the supplementary libraries I'm gonna talk about today uh, comes in. Sweet, I'm glad that that totally has both words on there. Um, Airbnb engineers wanted to use SQLite for their caching layers, and so they contributed a supplementary library for SQLite caching, and it's called Apollo SQLite. And it really only differs from the in-memory cache in terms of where cache results are stored in a SQLite cache instead of directly in memory. And this wasn't the only thing that's been added by the community. There were developers who were interested in supporting subscriptions or a way to have the server automatically update your client if the data behind a given query changed automatically. If you're here for the last uh, talk, you saw an example of that with the, with the GraphQL game show. So for instance, if you have a list of reviews of episodes of Star Wars, you might want to be notified immediately when you get a new review that's added to the list so you can display it. And under the hood, this is most often accomplished using WebSockets. And several community uh, members got together and worked on an Apollo WebSocket implementation, which uses leading iOS WebSocket library Starscream uh, to handle all of the socket connections and only focuses on how to handle the data coming back and forth over that connection. And basic handling for this looks very much like the handling for other queries and mutations. You get the result and then you switch on it. If it's a networking failure, it'll go down to the failure case. Uh, if it, you get a response back from the server, then you need to check whether that response contains a result, uh, an error from your GraphQL server, or both, and handle these things appropriately. The main difference is that you have no idea how many times this closure is going to be called, so you need to do a little bit more setup work to make sure you don't wind up calling things that don't exist anymore. First, you'll need to make sure that you have something which is hanging on to your subscription. Then you'll want to make sure that you're not creating a retain cycle before doing any of your handling and bail if self has been deallocated. Then you'll do your normal handling. And then finally, you'll have to make sure that whatever is hanging on to your subscription actually cancels that subscription whenever it gets deallocated. So these are all of the things that the iOS SDK is doing right now. But you may be thinking, well, that sounds nice, but what are you doing to really push the SDK forward? I love that cat. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the future of the iOS SDK, uh, because I want to give a small preview of the things that are coming up the pike with varying degrees of certainty. There are a few things that are coming sooner rather than later, and also with a lot more certainty. And a lot of this stuff came from the developer survey that we ran in late August and early September. Because while we find out a lot of useful information from some basic multiple choice questions and surveys about some of the ideas, one thing really jumped out in the freeform responses to a few of our questions. When we asked both what was the thing people were having the most trouble with and what we could do to make their lives easier, we found an enormous number of responses pointing to the fact that our documentation really needed to get beefed up, particularly around the more advanced features of the library. And so the past few weeks, I've tried really hard to focus on getting better documentation together. We now have full documentation for how to use WebSockets, and I've tried really hard to make the caching documentation in particular better. But documentation only goes so far. I'm also going to be working on a much more comprehensive tutorial and sample app. We have a pretty basic starter application people can play with at the moment, but we found it doesn't cover a lot of the cases where people have been having problems. This is basically the project that I'm going to be working on after Summit. Now, Within this survey, I also took the opportunity to share some of my ideas about the library and where I want it to be going in the future, because I want to make sure I'm at least roughly on the same page as the community in terms of what I wanted to do. So I made a scale ranging from LOL no to great idea to gauge interest in the ideas, and I got some pretty good responses on a couple of them. Um, one of the strongest responses was to asking if we should use Swift's built-in codable conformance instead of custom JSON parsing that we're using at the moment. So I think this would be advantageous since there are a lot of convenient things you can do with objects that conform to this protocol beyond parsing. And our users were overwhelmingly in favor of this idea. Uh, we, we got zero LOL no's. I was very excited about that. Uh, related to this, both I personally and several other people interested in contributing to our code generation have found that trying to adjust TypeScript code that generates Swift code is unnecessarily difficult especially in terms of figuring out exactly how TypeScript's type systems work. So codable support is actually going to wind up being part of a larger project, which is moving our Swift code generation to Swift. 
Now, I will note that at least for now, we're going to keep the parsing of schema and validation of queries we've already got going in TypeScript, but we're going to move the actual generation of Swift code to Swift. This is going to make it a lot easier for iOS developers to understand and potentially fix the code that's generating their model objects and parsing. It also removes some of the tighter coupling between the, the uh, TypeScript CLI and the Apollo iOS SDK. With the improved ease of development that comes from both not having to switch between languages and not having to switch between repos in order to build this, I'm planning to add several features that have long been requested, specifically the codable conformance that I talked about earlier. Uh, we also heard from a lot of folks that it would be really helpful for the generated objects to conform to equatable. So iOS 13 added some new diffing mechanisms that are a huge improvement over what already existed and which are a really critical part of getting Swift UI to work. A huge piece of these and other diffing mechanisms uh, rely on objects conforming to the equatable and hashable protocols. So we're planning to add support for that to these exciting, to, to, to be able to support these exciting new tools and toys. We're also looking to solve some problems involving regeneration of code by generating the list of file inputs and outputs. Right now, if you don't pre-specify your input and output files manually, the build script can cause rebuild loops when working with things that get rebuilt when any file changes, such as Swift UI or IB designables. With a generated file list, we'd be able to have you set that up once and then allow code generation to take care of creating the updated file lists for you. I'm also particularly excited about implementing fragments as protocols. The nested types currently generated by CodeGen are not the same objects, even if they contain the same properties. Now, this is really helpful for ensuring that all of the returned objects contain only the requested properties and not all of the possible properties of a type which may not have even been requested. However, with fragments, it's a little bit annoying because it means you have to specify exactly which call you're using before handing things off to your UI, since the objects returned by each call are different. But if multiple calls use the same fragment, they should contain the same information. That's why representing fragments as protocols is really exciting for me because it will allow you to pass in any type conforming to the protocol in a type safe fashion without having to specify which call that it's coming from. So I'm psyched about that. More ambitiously, I'd like to essentially deprecate the entire part of this talk about double optionals <laughs> by adding an enum type that I'm tentatively calling a GraphQL optional that more clearly outlines the possibilities of what needs to be sent to the server. I'd also love to add some automatic conformance to the Swift 5.1 identifiable protocol since this is also a huge help for diffing in Swift UI and may have some benefits to us uh, from a caching standpoint as well. Particularly for these last two bullet points, there are some things I'm still working on in terms of implementation, so these may be subject to change. So these are things that I plan to be working on for the next three or, three or so months. But I also want to talk about a few plans that I have that are way longer term. These are a little fuzzier, uh, but I want to share some of these goals and then talk about why I'm sharing them. Uh, the first thing is that I want to better validate that a particular version of our SDK works with all three major package managers. I've already added some dummy checks for this, but they're all manual. So I'm planning to get a dependency manager test suite up and running with examples of the app built with CocoaPods, Carthage, and a Swift package manager that I can actually test new versions against and make sure that no, nobody accidentally breaks your favorite package manager. Another thing I want to look at in long term is how we can improve the usability and performance of our caching strategy, particularly when it comes to cache eviction and expiration, which is essentially handled manually at the moment. This has a possibility of getting uh, moved up to coincide with the code gen rewrite, but I'm attempting to not break too, too many things at the same time, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Another thing I want to do in the longer term is add more supplementary libraries to help better integrate with popular libraries. This was one of the ideas that I suggested in the developer survey because it turns out that concurrency is really, really hard. It's hard to do many things at the same time and have it all work out correctly, including typing, but especially also including working with networking and caching. And people were pretty enthusiastic about this idea. I got a tiny little number of LOL no's and a lot of, ooh, great ideas. And I want to emphasize that the list of things that I want to do this for is very highly subject to change. But particularly if you're interested in Rx Swift, I would love to talk to you about a partnership on this. Because ultimately, a huge part of the reason that I am sharing these longer term goals with you is that I am only one person. And the future of this library should not just be about what I can do personally. I want it to be about what you as the community want and what we can all build together. And also, for real, I would love to get some help uh, to get some of these bigger ideas 
out of the starting blocks faster. So I recently updated the contributor guide for the iOS repo. If you're interested, read it, hit me up with any questions. And with that, we have reached the portion of the talk where I realize I've gone through 169 slides in 25 minutes. I should probably remind you of a few things I'd like for you to take away from this talk. Um, if you tried to use Apollo iOS before and got frustrated, check out the new setup. It is considerably simpler than it was. If you're just getting started now, I commend your timing. Um, you should also check out our updated documentation. I have tried to plug the biggest holes, but if there's anything that you're having trouble understanding, please either reach out to me or open an issue, and I will try to get that addressed. Uh, in addition, there's going to be a new sample application and step-by-step -step tutorial coming soon for Apollo iOS. Please keep an eye out for that. There's also going to be some major updates to our code generation that will move a huge chunk of stuff to Swift. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more details about what's coming up, uh, there's an official roadmap uh, document that's in Markdown that I plan to update every month or so with where things are going at the moment. And finally, I would love any help I can get, even if it's just telling me exactly where some documentation needs to be improved. Remember that if it's making you nuts, it's almost certainly making somebody else nuts, and the whole community benefits when you contribute feedback and fixes to the main repo. So I wanted to thank you all for coming. I'm going to be in the Apollo Lounge for questions during breaks today. Come find me and say hi. Uh, I'm going to stick around for Q&A for a couple of minutes. Uh, favorite question gets a nice free copy of this book called Living by the Code that I got interviewed for. But there's like 40 other people interviewed in it, so it's not just about me. Um, thank you all so much. Or not. <laughs> Hello? Raise your hand if you've got a question. Is there a mic around here? Oh, yeah. There is a mic. Check. All right. Uh, all right. Apparently, no one has questions. All right. Got one question down here. Uh, Hello, hello. Oh, there we go. Um, Jim Isaacs from Netflix. Uh, I was wondering what you think about the code gen in terms of uh, uh, how everything is coupled to a query, and if that's ever going to be optional in a new version of it. Yeah. That's a good question, and I think um, it, it's something that I don't think I really understood well until I got more involved in the, the iOS SDK. Because in, in the schema, you, you're able to define a full type. You're able to say, OK, this is like everything that could possibly ever happen with a, uh, with a user, for instance. And one of the things that you can do with GraphQL is you can create a request that actually includes, uh, includes only optional properties, but doesn't include non-optional properties. So the reason that we're generating these queries in a way that um, allows you to, or in the way where they're all using that, that sort of nested system is that that allows us to say very safely, these are the only things that you can get back uh, from this particular query. We're not going to even give you the opportunity to try to ask for a property that's not there. Um, and as, as far as I know, that's not something we plan on changing. But I think it's something where that was one of the things that was really hard for me to wrap my head around when I first started uh, in terms of why that was happening. But I think as I learned more about sort of what the limitations are around GraphQL, that's why we're gener generating it in that nested way so that essentially we're, we're trying to make sure we're not like accidentally tying people's shoelaces together so they trip and fall on their face. We want to make sure that you can only ask for properties that are actually there. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. We got one more question over there. Do you want to? Uh, maybe you just ask them to come find you just because we have to. Uh, make okay. Apparently, we're getting kicked out of the room. Everybody, thank you for coming. I'm gonna. I, I would let, come find me like right over here uh, if you're interested in more questions. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>